feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now. Nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. It's a great night because I have a very close friend and collaborator who will be speaking. I'll get to her in a couple minutes. Uh, this is, if you haven't noticed, this is the National University of Singapore, Yong Lulin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar. We're in our 90, over 90 shows now, so we're getting close to the uh, centenary milestone, which will be exciting. I want to remind you to use the Q&A function uh, to send questions. And we have Dong Lu here tonight, and she'll be dealing with those questions. And uh, she works on this particular topic. So I think that she'll be a great moderator for that. Uh, and before we get started talking about ovaries, I want to introduce Insa, who's a Tomasic Polytech intern and a member of the National the NUS Healthy Longevity Translational Research Program. And she'll be talking about proteomic and genomic profiling of senescent cells. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Ensu, and I will be sharing my team's study on the proteomic and genomic profile of senescent cells in the cardiovascular system. To provide an insight into the study, Singapore has an aging population, and it's predicted that by 2030, 25% of the population will be aged 65 years and above. As a result, Healthcare costs have risen, which is a concern because it adds to the already afflicted elderly's financial burden. According to the National Council of Aging, the majority of the top 10 common chronic conditions ailing the elderly are cardiovascular diseases, which are highlighted in the red boxes. Currently, we understand that aging causes physiologi physiological changes such as arterial stiffening and thickening of the heart walls. However, the underlying causes for these changes remain vague and generic. Thus, our goal is to understand the cardiovascular system's aging process on a molecular level to develop interventions that promote healthy longevity. We're inducing cells to undergo replicative senescence to simulate the natural aging process. Replicative senescence is a process in which cells continuously divide over a long period and eventually become no longer viable. When a typical cellular division occurs, identical daughter cells are produced. However, as the cell continuously replicates, the ability to avoid DNA damage gradually decreases, producing abnormal cells with damage to DNA. Eventually, the accumulation of DNA damage results in replicative senescence. When the cells senesce, their secretory profile changes, such as the production of senescence-associated secretory phenotype. SASP, which negatively influences crucial cellular processes, such as cell proliferation and cell survival. The cell secretome contains proteins, lipids, and RNA that are released by the cells. Hence, during the study, cells in the cardiovascular system will be continuously cultured to induce replicative senescence. Cells and the secretome collection will be performed for every cell passage whereby cells were transferred from one container to another for growth and replication. RNA extraction and protein concentration of the cell secretome will be performed for the use of a multiplexing technology to assess the proteomic and genomic profile as the cells gradually senesce. To further elaborate on multiplexing technology, 
It reduces time consumption and costs spent on experiments, as we can evaluate multiple protein or gene targets within a single sample. Moreover, a comprehensive view of the data is provided, allowing us to perform quicker data analysis. We conducted a pilot study and obtained positive preliminary results on the aged cells, proteomic and transcriptomic profiles. Proteomic evaluation on the cell secretum was performed to understand how the protein expression in the cells changes over time. We chose to analyze the three proteins, MMP2, MMP3, and MMP9, as they play a crucial role in the formation of blood vessels, or angiogenesis for short. Results obtained from multiplexing indicated that the cells release a lesser amount of these angiogenic proteins as they age, suggesting that cells will take longer to form new blood vessels. On the other hand, transcriptomic evaluation was performed to understand how the genes are being expressed under different conditions, in our case, between aged and young cells. We looked into P21 and beta-galactosidase as overexpression of both genes contributes to cellular senescence and is commonly observed in aged cells. It was observed in the RNA that aged cells do express more of these genes compared to when it was younger. I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I would like to acknowledge the Healthy Longevity team, Dr. Rufaiha, Dr. Marik, Ms. Sabrina, and Mr. Yola for their guidance and contribution to this project. Thank you. Uh, excited to see where that project goes. Um, so uh, it's my privilege tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Yushin So. Uh, she is the Charles and Marie Robertson Professor of R Reproductive Sciences and Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, and also a professor in Genetics and Development and the Director of the Reproductive Aging at Columbia University. That's a mouthful, Yushin. Uh, she's done a lot of work on genetics over the years and epigenetic control of aging and disease. And more recently, her lab has uh, started focusing on ovarian aging. So tonight she'll be talking about ovarian aging, a target for geroprotection in women. Thanks for joining this, Yushin. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're great. Oh, great. Okay, so if you could show my slide. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Brian. I would also like to thank um, Yong Sun, Dong Lu, and uh, Joe um, for this opportunity to present. So as Brian said, my lab has been taking a human genetics and functional genomics approach to understand the fundamental mechanisms of aging in humans. And um, I'm going to talk about mechanisms of ovarian aging, which is really new um, to, to us. So like many of you in the audience, um, we've been, let me do the presenter mode. Does this work, Brian? Can you still yeah, see I the full see, screen? It looks correct. I don't know. Can you not advance? I do. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Okay, good. Yeah. So our research uh, framework has been geroscience, of course, right? So, so aging is the risk factor for all chronic diseases. So targeting the fundamental biology of aging will delay and prevent even reverse um, multiple age-related diseases simultaneously. So when we are in the field of ovarian aging, reproductive aging, we did a lot of literature search to catch up. And through the eye of um, geroscientists, it was really clear that um, ovarian aging can be targeted for geroprotection in women. And I'm going through why we think so, right? So ovary is the very first organ to age in the human body. It starts in around the age of um, mid thirties with rapid decline in function, which culminates uh, in menopause around the age 50. Okay, so compared to male, female has strikingly shorter reproductive lifespan. So fun effects. So women, the um, oldest age of woman who uh, gave birth naturally is 59, whereas it's 92 who, uh, for male who produce offspring naturally. Striking difference. So over the last 200 years, as you know, that human life expectancy has increased steadily 
but um, Asian menopause remains largely unchanged, meaning that more and more women live their you know, ever increasing proportion of their lives in postmenopausal stage. And is it bad? It is bad because menopause coincide with a cascade of very deleterious health outcome in cognitive, immune, bone and cardiovascular system, among others. In fact, menopause accelerate biological aging as measured by epigenetic clock. And there's a genetic component in this menopause accelerated uh, biological aging. Consistently with this genetic link, women uh, with later menopause live longer than women with earlier menopause. And interestingly, brothers of women with later menopause have a pro longevity advantage. Okay. So what happens if you remove ovary? Ovaryectomy or oophorectomy increases uh, the single diseases in um, neurocognitive, cardiovascular, and metabolic disease, but also it increases risk for uh, multimorbidity as well as all cause mortality, right? So if you conserve ovary at the time of hysterectomy, those women um, live, survive longer than um, completely ovaryectomized women. Okay, finally, in mice, if you transplant young ovary into old mice, that it confer prolongevity effect, it has extends lifespan as well as health span in part by reducing inflammation and increased insulin sensitivity. So this suggests to us that ovary does much more than reproduction, but influence overall health and um, health span in women. So ovarian aging, again, under the geroscience uh, framework, can be targeted for geroprotection in women. But what is the biological mechanism of ovarian aging? Unfortunately, we know very little. But what's been well documented, at least in humans, like in many Asian-related phenotypes, there's enormous heterogeneity in ovarian aging, as uh, shown here is uh, age and natural menopause, you can see that it starts from you know, early 30s all the way to late 50s, okay? Using these differences in timing of menopause as a trait, now you can perform a large scale genomide association studies to identify genetic variants that contribute to uh, differences in timing in um, menopause. And this is one of the largest the largest study involving more than 200,000 women identifying 290 single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, when we look at this variant, far majority of them occur in the non-coding regions, suggesting that you know, this variant contribute to this inter-individual variability in ovarian aging by changing the regulatory capacity, right? So, but this is really very challenging to understand and interpret the role of this non-coding variants in ovarian aging, because first of all, um, because of this large, um, very extensive linkage disequilibrium in the human genome, there are many, if not hundreds, variants in the locus show association with phenotype in this case, uh, age and natural menopause. So to identify true causal variant is really challenging. And a lot of regulatory element, especially enhancers, can work over long distance, sometimes skipping many genes in between through this DNA looping with promoter. So to identify causal genes that are under um, regulated by causal variant, is not clear. And regulatory elements um, have cell type specific functions. So to identify causal cell types that are influenced by these causal variants and genes, of course, is not clear, let alone mechanisms. 
So what do you do? So no, we and others take um, variants that are associated with um, variants of your um, trait of interest, in this case, um, menopause, and then you perform integrative analysis using GWAS as well as um, functional genomic data and epigenome data. Okay, so for example, you can identify variants that occur in active regulatory elements in different cell types, um, changes in transcription factor binding, there are correlated gene expression, expression changes, as well as you know, interaction with um, chromatin um, to identify causal regulatory element as well as causal regulatory variant and affected the target genes as indicated by this nice figure um, by Sung Su Kim in the lab. So for example, we have a lot of data at the single cell level already from several years ago. So you can really carefully study functional variants in the brain related traits, but in the ovary, unfortunately, we don't have any data. Ovary is very complex organ with multiple cell types that uh, support ovarian function. So for example, there's a thicker cells and granulosa cell that's a major component of follicles, stroma cells, epithelial cells, smooth so muscle cell, and the thelial cells from blood and lymphatic origin as well as immune cells, right? So to address this challenge in interpreting um, GWAS of menopause, as well as to understand the mechanism of ovarian aging in humans, a postdoc in the lab, a Chen Jin, decided to take ovaries from young um, women in their 20s and uh, reproductively old women in their late 40s and um, early 50s. And uh, these are samples from um, sudden death board. So they are pathological, histopathologically known. Okay. So using this um, ovaries, Chen was able to generate a single nuc RNA seq profile as well as single nuc ATEC seq profile, detecting all these major cell types in the ovary. And now with this data, you can integrate GWAS. So for example, by integrating with the data, Chen realized that um, a lot of menopause associated variants occur in the um, regulatory element that are active across multiple cell types, as you can see here. So this is indicating different cell types in the ovary, okay? And um, by looking at curative target genes, which means genes that are nearest of the variants, Chen also saw that those genes are significantly enriched in genes expressing um, not just one, but multiple cell types in the ovary. Again, here's trauma cells, um, blood endothelial cells, granulosa cells, muscle cell, and so on. Okay, so age and natural menopause associated variants um, are enriched in multiple cell types in the ovary, if not all. In comparison, Chen also took GWAS data from polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, which is um, disorder, hormonal disorder of young reproductive aged women. And in this case, you see enrichment of uh, target genes in granulosa cell where the hormone is produced, as well as ovarian epithelial cancer, then you see enrichment of those genes in epithelial cells. So this result suggests that age and natural menopause associated variant has global impact across many cell types in uh, ovarian gene regulatory network. So now using this data, we can identify causal genes and causal variants. So for example, in healthy locus, you see potentially causal variants that occur in regulatory elements that are active in 
all cell types in the ovary. Okay. Interestingly, based on uh, GTEx analysis, C allele of this variant is correlated with increased expression of HELB gene in the ovary. Surprisingly, not only ovary, but this variant is associated with increased expression of HELB gene in all tissues that have been um, studied in GTEx, right? Including muscle, um, artery, and all the way to the brain, okay? And then when you look at those sequences, then you can see that this C allele may increase um, transcription um, factor binding activities, okay? So it turned out that T allele, which is correlated with the reduced expression of HELB, is associated with later menopause, okay? So this is at most correlation and uh, prediction. So how do we experimentally validate to establish the causality? So what we use, uh, which is spearheaded by uh, Chi Ping Yang, another postdoc in the lab, we take a uh, human pluripotent stem cell, uh, both embryonic stem cell and induced pluripotent stem cell, and engineer with a CRISPR to carry the particular causal variants that we identify and prioritize through our in silico integrative analysis. And then we differentiate them into multiple cell types of ovary, including granulosa cells, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cell and trauma cells. And then using these cells, you can really study the regulatory output of that particular variants to establish or to validate the causal variants and causal genes that you predicted. And importantly, you can study the directional impact of the variants on expression of the causal genes and study the cell type specificity and then a begin um, very detailed mechanistic studies, including the underlying transcription factors. So again, I'm showing you example of this HELB variant. So when you're studying regulatory variant, gold standard is to use heterozygote cells. So in this case, everything else is the same except for this variant of your interest. Right, And then you identify coding variants that are linked to the regulatory variant so that you can use the relative expression level as a readout of the regulatory capacity of the regulatory non-coding variants, okay? So control experiment, when you take genomic DNA, of course, they are heterozygote. So you can see 50 versus 50 uh, contribution. But when you do uh, take cDNA and perform a least specific digital PCR to look at the relative expression level, then you can immediately see that T allele that are associated with um, later menopause now cause reduced expression of HELB gene as predicted by uh, GTEx analysis and everything. Consistently, we also take a primary granulosa cells uh, discarded from IVF clinic, uh, four donors of heterozygote carriers. And then in this case, you can also see that T allele carriers show reduced expression of HELB compared to C allele, okay? So, so this way we can uh, really establish the causality of in silico predicted um, role of causal variant and expected target genes. So what happened uh, during aging in terms of a transcriptome? So Chen found about 3000 genes that going up and down with age in the ovary. And he found that they change in the same direction across different cell types, showing that they show these coordinated age-related changes across ovarian cell types. When you look at these differentially expressed genes in the ovary, they are enriched in so-called hallmark pathways of aging that we have discovered through very elegant studies in the 
other organisms from yeast to worms to flies and mice, right? So, so for example, um, these are some of the hallmark pathway of aging that um, occurs um, during aging process in the human ovary that show coordinated um, changes, right? So you see down regulation of uh, protein homeostasis, DNA repair, oxidative phosphorylation, but you see also upregulation of nutrient sensing signaling, including mTOR and insulin uh, signaling pathway. As you know, mTOR is a um, central regulator of aging and its inhibitor, what rapamycin, is known to extend lifespan and health span in all, in all organisms that have been tested thus far. So it has been used as a gold standard of germ protector, namely a drug that target fundamental biology of aging, thereby um, promote health span and lifespan, right? So our data suggests that ovary can be a geroprotective target of rapamycin. Together with the increasing evidence that rapamycin slows aging in the ovary, thereby um, increase ovarian lifespan, ovarian reserve, uh, fertility, and so on. We at Columbia initiated clinical trial to evaluate the ability of rapamycin to extend uh, reproductive lifespan in humans. So now the study is alive. It's called a uh, vibrant study, validating benefits of rapamycin for reproductive aging treatment. So this is a website that uh, people can um, enroll for recruitment. And so this is a brief study design. So we are going to uh, recruit, this is pilot study um, supported by Impetus Grant. Uh, 50 individuals um, have placebo group and treat them with um, low-dose rapamycin for three months and follow up for additional nine months. We initially wanted to follow up for 12 months, but IB, uh, uh, our school said, no, it's, it's, you have to do nine months. Okay, so this is a study design. So our primary uh, clinical outcome is, over, of course, ovarian reserve markers. But using this um, very unique cohort of rapamycin trial, we are also going to identify multi-omic-based biomarkers to draw mechanistic insights. So to summarize my talk, um, ovary is the first organ to age in the uh, human body, um, represent a model of accelerated aging. It influences not only reproduction, but also overall health and lifespan in women. And through our single cell multi-omic analysis, we could uh, identify causal variants and causal genes that are associated with the timing of um, ovarian aging and validate those using stem cell differentiation paradigm. And through our RNA-seq analysis, we show that ovarian aging proceeds through the conserved mechanism of aging showing that they can be a target of known gel protectors. Um, and um, using rapamycin as a first um, study, vibrant study is undergoing to test the hypothesis of its ability to improve both reproductive and overall health span in women. With that, I'd like to thank the members of the lab um, who contribute to this study, Chen, um, Adam, Sung Su, CJ, Jiping, and Ming Ju, as well as wonderful collaborators, who especially Zev Williams, who's leading the vibrant study uh, as a co-PI, um, and other people, and the funding sources, um, NIA, Impetus Grant, and Chisia Lely. With that, I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Yushin. That's really interesting. And I have to tell you tonight, I'm having a glass of wine while we're doing this. And the reason is that every time I went to China or Korea or anywhere else with Yushin, you would go to dinners and be expected to drink. <laughs> 
and you should never like to drink that much. And so she would sit beside me and wait till I finished my drink, which was usually a shot. Uh, and then she would like switch the two drinks. So I had to drink her drink too. So the next morning, every time I was in Asia, she would be vibrant and alert and I would still be hung over. So uh, <laughs> don't forgive you. No, I know over dinner, people like to sit next to me because they can have my wine. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> you had to compete. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, before we get started on details, how, how did you, what drove you into ovarian aging? Say that again, sorry. How did you get into ovarian aging? I mean. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's an interesting story. Um, as you know, I, I'm not a reproductive scientist. I know very little. I knew very little. I'm, I still do not very much, uh, other than the fact that I'm going through ovarian aging, which is really awful. Right, but um, Columbia approached me to uh, establish reproductive aging at Columbia, OBGYN department, and um, then I started to think about it. You know how frustrated it was that very little is known about basic mechanism of so of ovarian aging, and uh, you know historically, as you know, Brian, it has been the area, the field is underfunded, understudied, underserved. And yet it's such an important field for overall women's health, right? So that's how I got into it. So we didn't, so it will have been uh, four years as of October this year. And I must say over 70% of my lab are involved in one or another aspects of ovarian aging. And I'm very, very pleased with it. So, well, you know, it's a reflection of a bigger issue. I think generally research on females has been underrepresented, yeah. understudied, and underfunded. And I know the NIH has tried to solve that now, but it's historically, there's been so many less studies looking at even common things in women. Most of the studies are done in men for a variety of reasons. And, and uh, when you look at aging, the differences between men and women are so profound that it's yeah. really, it's a shame. You know, I noticed you got funded by the GCRLE and the, the, the Bia Echo Foundation behind that. And I just wanted to uh, single that out because our Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity here at NUS is also funded by that foundation. And so yeah, they, yeah. they made a big impact on getting research moving in this field. So. Yeah, I'm extremely grateful, right? So it, um, Jennifer Garrison, as you know, you know, she's leading this initiative and she really embraced this outsider like me as a family and she uh, guided me through and it really, uh, it's been exciting journey. A, a lot to do, but I think we are in the right foot. So let's talk science. Um, the, the, you mentioned this observation, which I've heard before and I, I still have trouble thinking about it. So you said that uh, brothers of women who undergo menopause late also live longer. So yeah. that would suggest, I think, that there's something genetic, intrinsic to people that slows male aging and ovarian aging at the same time. It's not as if the in those people that something happening in the ovaries is slowing the aging process it seems more like there's a general phenomenon that slows both ovaries and normal aging is that how you interpret it yeah a very good point so i mean that's the reason why i wanted to highlight this healthy gene variants right so not only ovary or ovarian cell types that's correlated with the increased expression or decreased expression whatever you call it depending upon the allele in all the tissues that have been profiled in GTEx. There are 45 tissues in the GTEx. Mm -hmm. In every single tissue you see the correlation, mm -hmm. right? So I really think that um, there are common underlying mechanism in addition to a very specific role, right? That may explain this uh, brother, I know, male sibling connection. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the so do, if you look at your GWAS, did you find you found something like Hel B, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's common to other tissues? Did you find things that were specific to ovaries? Uh, we are um, digging into it now. Um, so, one of the locus that we are studying um, 
in relation to uh, menopause as well as reproductive lifespan is a uh, PRCA1 locus. Okay, this was detected as um, one of the risk loci for age and natural menopause, even, even not even with you know, 200,000 individuals, but with much less, so very strong signal. It turned out to be very gene dense region. Okay, so a priori, you cannot really say PRCA1 is your target gene, but people call it because you know it's a PRCA1 gene, yeah. right? So in just, uh, just to interject, BRCA1 is a risk factor for uh, breast cancer and I think uh, other forms of cancer as well. And that's correct. So it's very it's critical component of genome maintenance involved in DNA damage uh, repair, DNA damage signaling, and so on. Right. So in our hands, it turned out at least for ovarian cell types, it's not BRCA1. Target gene is next door gene, something else. Okay, but it, again, in our hands, it's uh, ovarian cell type specific. It's not in the you know other tissues, right? Mm -hmm. So there are ovary specific uh, variants. I'm talking about the the functional impact, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, how many different genes are there to study from this GWAS? You had a lot of SNPs that came out. And you told us about a couple. It seems like there's a sort of treasure trove of things to look into here. Yeah, you know, the GWAS of Asian natural menopause is very unique because if you look at potential target genes, again, it's nearby genes, then uh, they are enriched for DNA damage repair and response. Mm -hmm. Very unique. I have never seen any traits like that, right? So suggesting that those are genome maintenance related genes play, play a critical role. Okay, so through this integrative analysis, you know, you can have multiple layers. And then when we do really high probability, really likely to be causal variants, we identify over 10 or so. So those are genes and variants that we are really deeply studying because they can be a target, zero protective target for women. So right? naively, that sounds like a lot for a GWAS study. Uh, just, uh, is it, uh, is it the genetic variants are maybe really informative in this context, it seems like, you know, there's, you do a lot of general aging studies, and it's hard to find GWAS variants that are that beyond a few genes. And here you have 10 from one study. So. Yeah, I mean, again, this is not just signal, but it's likely to be causal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are excited about this. Something, you'll have a, the next 20 years of your lab trying to do functional. <laughs> well, yeah, we are even interested in making mouse models, right? Because uh -huh. we can really mimic the effect of the um, variants, right? If it's beneficial allele, you want to mimic it. If it's a deleterious allele, you want to counteract the effect, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we do the whole business. So with Hel B, it's uh, it's something that's overexpressed that's accelerating menopause. It sounds like, uh, and uh, uh, I don't remember what Hel B is. Is it a helicase or just? Yeah, it's the... a helicase B downstream of um, ATM double strand break um, damage signaling. What's interesting that you made a good point, Brian, that um, the the group in uh, UK they look at um whole exome sick data from large um, database, UK Biobank. And then they found rare coding variants. That's mostly truncation mutations. So you just, it's a knockout basically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then they found that this truncation mutations, rare variants are enriched in um, early menopause women who undergo early menopause, right? So directionality makes sense. Somehow you, you know, if you lose, uh, sorry, I made it, I said it wrong, later menopause. So if you, if you kill the protein function, then you undergo menopause later, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is uh, consistent with our discovery that if you express less, then you undergo menopause later, right? So it all I'm makes sense. Are there more DNA mutations associated with higher expression? Or that, this would seem like the prediction then, right? 
Yes, yeah, so the prediction, I think this pathway uh, caused apoptosis. So I think it too, too efficient or the too much sensitivity to apoptosis is not good for ovarian reserve. It just depletes the cells too fast. I think exactly, yeah, that's the model. So there's another gene variant that um, this Ruth et al. paper uh, discovered as check two. Again, it's in the same yeah. pathway. And same story, if you have a truncation mutations that, you know, that's correlated with later menopause, in mice, if you knock it out, check two, then you have extended reproductive lifespan. Mm -hmm. So again, so, you know, there's a DNA damage signaling pathway that if you dampen it, it may be beneficial. Interesting. It's, 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 it's almost counterintuitive, right? To think that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because there's a lot of data suggesting that DNA damage is a driver of ovarian aging. And here you're saying that if you turn down response pathways that you actually yeah. Um, yeah. You know, actually that reminds me of one of the centenarian associated variants in P P53, right? Uh -huh. So this is, um, yeah. again, coding variants that are enriched in centenarians, but it turned out they are um, more, Again, I'm always confused with this directionality, right? So they are less, okay, less sensitive to apoptosis. So if you protect your genome or tumor suppressor mechanism through other pathway, then dampening down apoptosis is beneficial when it comes to aging, right? It's a little bit, so I think it's an antagonistic pleiotropic yeah. aspect yeah. of genome maintenance. So... Uh, if I'm thinking about this correctly, if you make the cells more sensitive to apoptosis mm -hmm. or by turning down expression more resistant to apoptosis, you might imagine that that could affect the germline mutation rate. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so a mouse model would be really interesting here to, and then to look at germline mutations because, you know, it's nice to have the reserve, uh, ovarian reserve preserved. Uh, but maybe not if it's if it's causing As a cause of the increase in mutation rate. Yes. So interestingly, this is a topic that we are um, studying uh, in collaboration with Jan Beach, mm -hmm. who has this beautiful mutation detection method in in situ in vivo. So that's the question that we are going to address, right? It, in other words, is there any trade off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Are you doing epigenetics? For ovarian aging, um, yes, um, you know, when you're looking at regulatory element, that's something that you cannot not do. <laughs> 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 yeah, so so that, that's an active area of research, especially since now we have this, um, you know, engineered variant. Mm -hmm. Well, you can take, take um, heterozygous cells and then look at the impact of the allele, right? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. This is exact area of research. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's it's, it's, it's like finding a, a new. Uh, I, I, we've started working on ovarian aging from a different viewpoint, but it's uh, it, it's exciting to find new areas to work on. You know, I, we've Extremely uh, been around exciting. a while doing research. Uh, yeah, uh, Yushin yeah. still, still only thirty seven, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, we've been doing research for a long time. She started when she was like six, so it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, well, uh, Brian, I must say that this uh, rapamycin-related things, I I really am um, inspired by you and Matt when he had a lab in China, you know, more than ten years yeah. ago. Because yeah. at the time, you guys were nonstop talking about rapamycin, so I sort of brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> it's always in my head. I thought you just tuned us out. So <laughs> I know I. It's like my kid. I try. I, you know, behave as if I ignore it, but it's always ingrained, <laughs> right? You so, learn from your parents, right? So tell so us more say. about the rapamycin study. What age of women? Who? What? I didn't catch all the details. Who? Who's enrolled yeah. in the study? Yeah. So these are women who desire fertility. So it, 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 get some benefit out of this study, but they couldn't. So they um, tried everything, but they failed. They could mm -hmm. not generate a euploid embryo. So they are waiting for um, egg donor. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So these are women, um, middle age, uh, 38 through 45. Uh -huh. and, so, uh, so your primary endpoints are like um, uh, hormones expression and things like that, right? It, it's probably too yeah. small of a study to expect a higher birth rate in the, in the study. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So this is a pilot study, as I said. We are enrolling 50 people, you know, have placebo, have treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took took us a while to get, you know, as you know, IRB approval and so on. But it's now well, there's you know, concerns over rapamycin, which I think are uh, I, can be gotten around. I, I think there's we know enough about rapamycin to not um, to to avoid side effects to a large extent. But you know, when you're talking about women trying to get pregnant in a, in a drug that can slow proliferation, I'm sure the review board was. Uh, uh, I'm impressed that you got the study approved. Actually, I, I think it's yeah. great. It should be approved. Don't get me wrong, but it's a it's a big challenge to get that through. So it's a huge challenge. Actually, the minute it was the site was open, there were like hundred inquiries, emails. Yeah. So there are enormous interests out there, yeah. and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to find um, the Swiss but right dose, right treatment regimen, yeah. and so on. Right. Well, you know, there's also data and animal models on NAD precursors and also alpha ketoglutarate uh, preserving. Over Absolutely. Animals. Absolutely. So That's you... why I emphasize it's a general protectors that we already know, right? For example, I didn't show it for the interest of time, but we see the signature of senescence, increased senescence in multiple cell types. Mm -hmm. So senolytics or senomorphic could mm -hmm. be a potential uh, NAD precursors, you know, your drug <laughs> so it's all potential um, yeah. it, it makes you wonder about you know what the overlap really is between gero protection and ovarian protection and and i think an extension of that might be some of the benefits of on aging maybe through ovarian protection and uh uh and at so least in it female, really makes you rethink the female, whole yeah. thing i think yeah i better stop and let dong lu come in because i know she's excited to ask questions all right Thank you. It was fun. Um, hi. Hi, Dong And not only I am excited to ask questions, also the audience. Um, I'm going to ask some questions from the general topic about biological process over and aging first. Um, there is one highly voted question. So in general, lifespan of females are higher than males. Yeah. And this audience finds it paradoxical that faster reproductive aging and longer overall lifespan happens at the same time in women. And what's yeah. your opinion on this? Yeah, that's very interesting question. Something that we try to understand. I completely agree. It's paradoxical, right? So, you know, women live longer in any countries. It doesn't matter if you are in a um, country with very um, low life expectancy versus high life expectancy, it doesn't matter. Women outlive men. But interestingly, in general, women are uh, less healthy. They spend more time in hospital, more uh, physical disabilities. So, so that suggests to us that they are resilient to death, but not necessarily to health. We don't understand. As Brian said, there's enormous heterogeneity in you know, the disease susceptibility, right? So this is something that we are trying to understand. Why? How? Yeah, and I also heard the woman has a higher tolerance to pain, which makes sense because we have we tend to have more diseases and maybe a shorter lifespan. Well, I mean health span. Yeah. Uh, is it really true that women are because I'm extremely sensitive to pain? <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> I can Any confirm cool that, by the way. Yushin's always complaining about something bothering. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's fascinating, this uh, enormous differences um, in sex, all especially aging phenotypes. Yeah. That's why we should really get more funding for research that is for women's health and, what, I mean, female animals. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, so uh, I, this audience is interested to know if women who have multiple pregnancy have a higher risk, I mean, he meant by higher aging rates, I suppose, than those women who don't have children. 
Yeah, that's another very uh, important question. So, the you know the parity, the number of uh, children that um, women had have versus um, age-related disease and lifespan. You know, it's a it's at the realm of um, epidemiology, right? So, based on my um, our literature search, it's a little bit uh, unclear. It goes both way. Right. So this is something that NIA is really interested in uh, studying. So they are um, now having this uh, workshop on long term cost of reproduction. You know, long term aging cost of reproduction in, in November, it's, it's going to be held in Bethesda. That's exactly the point that we are trying to address. Right. Is, is pregnancy. I mean, some people believe that it's accelerating aging. Some people say that it may be protective because you become a little bit rejuvenated every time you do the reprogramming. So, so I think we really need to um, have um, science uh, evidence-based. Um, it's surprising we don't know the answer to this. I mean, there have been studies on this. Are they just contradictory or, or what's the problem? It's not consistent. Hmm. It's not consistent. Some, some cohorts say that the more babies you had, um, the longer you you live, or the other way around. That's probably that first one's probably fun, financed by the Singapore government. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, yeah. they want more babies. <laughs> I recently heard a talk by uh, Claudio Franceschi, and in in Italian, centenarians was the opposite. It's inversely correlated. So, in other words, um, you know, the more kids you have, uh, the worse off you are. I don't know if that's true or not, mm -hmm. but at least for Italians, that's mm -hmm. the data that he presented. Interesting. Thank you for your answer. So I'm kind of going to the next topic would be more specific um, about the multi-omics data. Um, so another question from the audience is that, are there any data on aging of ladies with rare inserted own cryopreserved ovaries or ovens? You mean, do we have multiomic data from preserved uh, ovary? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe preserved eggs too. Oh, actually, I don't know. Uh, not that we know. I mean, it's hard to get, right? I mean, those preserved eggs has usually has a purpose. And I think it's a regulatory, eggs. also regular, there must be regulatory hurdles to use those. Um, yeah. Materials, right? Mm, I agree. And um, how about um, because, I mean, polycystic ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. or endometriosis? Is there any research related to that, or, or like their genetic signals? Yeah. So, as I briefly showed during my talk, there are um, some reasonable size uh, GWAS studies been done. So, we know some curative genetic factors that underlie, you know, PCOS and uh, ovarian cancer. But as in many GWAS study, no one really, not many people do what we do, namely do the functional follow-up and to establish the causality, right? So I think we are on the same sort of level in um, mechanistic studies, right? But yeah. One of the things but, known for in the, in the, uh... Uh, aging studies with GWAS is uh, going beyond GWAS and looking at rare genetic variants that from animals are associated with aging. Uh, have you tried doing that in the ovarian data set? So that's actually what they did in this Ruth et R paper. This is you know, one of the largest study of the age and menopause. So uh, that study is um, focused on coding variants that changes uh, protein sequences and protein curative protein function. So as you said, by integrating um, those variants with uh, no encoding variants, you know, then, then you can really uh, improve the power, right? Mm -hmm. In your prediction, mm -hmm. right? So for example, healthy, as I said, you know, people with later, much later, extreme later menopause, they tend to have, um, truncation mutations, right? And then, then you have non-coding variants that cause reduced expression, 
right? So then, oh yeah, healthy must be very important. Number one, number two, you have to really dampen the ex expression or activity to be beneficial, uh, at least from the perspective of wearing aging. Mm -hmm. right? So, so that's uh, why I, I said, sorry, that's why I say this directional impact, functional directional impact determination is critical at the end of the day because you really want to help women, right? You need to have the causation cleared out. Exactly. exactly. And also, you know, how to help. Do you make it worse or better, right? They said that mTOR has a very niche, subtle regulation that you, you need to reach the balance. Um, that's, that's absolutely correct. So I, I, I wanted to mention that. So, you know, mTOR signaling is a little bit, um, you have to be very, very careful. So dose is critical because it's required for primordial activation, right? So if you dampen too much, then there's no ovulation, there's nothing. There's okay. no pregnancy at all. This menstrual exactly. Stop exactly. exactly. So how do you, you know, how do you find the sweet spot to improve or promote ovarian reserve without hurting that, right? Yeah, I, I think with normal aging in other tissues too, it, it, it gets misunderstood. You know, I think the, I don't think the goal is ever to turn down activated TOR when TOR needs to be activated. I think what's happened is in stem cell populations at least, and maybe in other tissues, other parts of the tissue, the basal levels keep creeping up. And uh -huh. so uh, what you have is no dynamic regulation anymore. It's on all the time and it can't be induced much more. And I think what the benefit of rapamycin is, is it's restoring the dynamicity of the pathway. And so I wonder if that's going on in the in the ovarian system as well. I mean, I don't think we know, but it's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, so we will we'll know after the trial. What's that? Yeah. We will get more information after the trial. Yeah. yeah, you know, we've been going back and forth with, uh, with respect to the dose, right? So the dose that we are settled on is the uh, this off-label dose that people use for yeah. their geroprotective effect. And we were wondering if then maybe a little too high. We don't know, right? So that's yeah. what, five milligrams once a week or something like that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, shall I continue to like- Yeah, we got time for one more question. Scientifically <laughs> demanding question. <laughs> um, probably from a scientist. So he was asking, um, I found it very interesting that reduced expression of help was associated with delayed menopause. Do you have any idea about fertility rates in those with the variant? I ask because help is purported to have a role in meiotic recombination. Yeah, yeah. No, that's something that um, needs to be done, right? This, again, this is at the realm of association, right? So now we have... Um, link, causal link between reduced expression or reduced activity of a healthy um, in, with respect to timing of menopause, but in terms of fertility, right? It, is there going to be any trade-off? We don't know, something that we have to say, but at least for the check two, the check two knockout mice show um, improve, I mean, extended reproductive lifespan, right? without affecting fertility. I think fertility was the same. So something that we should study mouse models for sure. So yeah. you've been, uh, thanks a lot for doing this. Uh, we could talk for hours um, and uh, I'll sit next to you next time we go to dinner so I can have more wine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Dong Lu, uh, great as always. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I wanna remind you to use the panelists and all attendees uh, function in the chat to may leave comments about the show or suggest uh, other shows we might do. Uh, we're looking for new members of our team. So if you're interested in research on healthy longevity, there's a QR code to look at in the back. And I'm excited to announce that uh, you need to save the date of February 29th, Leap Day. You should be able to remember that. Uh, and March 1st of 2024, because this will be our next Center for Healthy Longevity conference uh, on, un to, on Unlock Healthy Longevity Supplements. So we'll be discussing supplements in detail uh, and how they may or may not affect aging. Um, 
This is uh, the first global uh, scientific conference focused solely on the role of supplements as a geroprotective intervention. And we're trying to bring together scientists, clinicians, industry partners, consumer representatives, and uh, interested public to discuss the topic. So it should be fun. Um, there's a link in the chat box for that. Uh, the next show will be July 13th, and we'll be having Alex Javrenkov, who's the founder and CEO of In Silico Medicine, talking about AI for drug discovery and aging. Uh, Andrea Meyer will be doing the show. And I want to leave you with our uh, final video about an unexpected friendship by someone at 82 years old. Thanks again for joining us. When I first met him, he'd say two words, and you'd say, what would you say? Couldn't say anymore. And then all of a sudden, he started talking to me. How much pieces can you make a jigsaw puzzle? Me? A thousand pieces? What? My name is Seth and I'm four. Seth is uh, a very affectionate little boy. I'd hope that he would make a really good connection, like someone who's like a grandmother or grandfather, and he can maybe um, have that experience, you know, and um, have maybe an opportunity to have a relationship with one of these people. Think of... What's your dad do? Uh, I don't know. Do I don't know what my dad does. You don't know what your dad does? What is that? Because I don't know... I don't see my dad. Oh, you don't see your dad. That's no good. I didn't know that he didn't have a dad until he mentioned it. You can have this. You can put it on your head. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you ready? And... There we go. Oi! Hey, look. They come now. Yeah, there you are. See? That's you and that's me sort of clicked when I saw the photograph. Thought to myself, yeah, I used to be like that myself once. I'd like to see him grow up and be a happy boy. Which one do you want? I'll hang on to this one and you hold that one, all right? <laughs> Nothing gonna bring me down I 